I love being snotty and critical of diagrams in high school and <coughs> science text. <text. coughs> now, guys, here's a really, really, really amazing thing. I have some magnets here. You can come up and play with the scenes later. These are really strong, and I won't, uh, don't sue me if you get a blood blister handling these things. But the reason I brought these is that if you turn them around so that they repel each other, you, you ca I can't, I almost, I guess I could, force them together when they're repelling each other. The amount of force that I'm exerting here to try to hold them together is the amount of force that each one of these nuclei feel on each other when they first start to push away. The repulsive force is pounds of force on one atom. Now, if you have pounds of force on a single atom whose mass is utterly negligible, it approaches, it goes fast. <laughs> it speeds up really, really fast. And almost all the energy that's released in a nuclear explosion is the kinetic energy of these two guys pushing away from each other. It, it, it happens in a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of a second, and almost all the acceleration occurs right at the beginning, and then they're sort of coasting away as they get further apart from each other. But to have a macroscopically feelable repulsion force between two nuclei, that's dramatic. And that's why these things have so much energy. The amount of energy released from a nuclear reaction like this is on the order of 10 million times the amount of energy per atom compared to these reactions. So for a certain, well, I mean, it's 10 million times more energy. It's just unimaginable. Uh, I'll put those guys back together. <coughs> So the kind of energy that's being released here, I, people, uh, maybe this is just for the upper school science teachers, but the source of the energy that's released is electric potential energy that's in the nucleus. Somehow nature, and it happened in supernovas, managed to get all these protons and neutrons together in a ball, and the protons are just fiercely pushing on each other. And if you get them apart a little bit so the neutrons aren't acting as glue to hold it all together, it's an electrical push. It's a conversion of electrical potential energy into kinetic energy is what you get out of these things. Uh, <coughs> and now, let's see. Oh yeah, I, I meant to, uh, anybody see my glasses? <laughs> Here, good, 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 good. Uh, I meant to give you a little overview first, so let me do that first. Here are the main challenges. One, of course, is getting the fissionable materials, the uranium-235, the plutonium-239. I'm not going to focus on that. Los Alamos didn't focus on that. be happy to talk with you about that uh, if you want to. Here is, I've got all kinds of samples of things here. Here's yellow cake, the, sort of from the mines, where you start with, in, in terms of uranium-235. Uh, the, the, I'm just going to give you a list of the major stages here. You've got to get that material. That was a huge national effort to assemble those materials. Then you need to assemble, create, manufacture subcritical masses. I'll tell you what that means in a moment. Most of you, I think, probably know. Uh, and actually, let's talk about that right now. I'm, uh, let's, let's go into the command. So this is what you can get. This has the potential of being a chain reaction because what it takes to tickle this nucleus to make it fission, which is when the energy gets released, is a neutron. These atoms, when they do fission, create two or three more neutrons. And so that can be the analogy of the thermal energy high temperature that fires produce to help it spread through the fuel. Here you get one nucleus to fission, you'll get some neutrons coming out. If they happen to run into another uranium-235 nucleus and make it fission, it's going to produce three more neutrons. And if, so you've got the possibility. Of, and the neutrons are the, ch are the chain. You need a neutron to get a nucleus to fission. You produce neutrons when you get a fission. So you've got the potential for a chain reaction. <coughs> uh, you guys, I'm sure, talk about scale models of atoms. I'm going to show you how hard this is going to be. Um, suppose we have... I'm used to having a blackboard or something like that, and I didn't really come equipped for that. But... Um, if you magnify an atom so that the electrons, the whole atom as a whole, comes out to be about the size of a soccer field, 100 yards, 100 meter, and of course atoms don't have edges. The electrons just sort of fade away. But in any case, roughly that big. Uh, then for all atoms, the size of the nucleus will range between about half a centimeter and a centimeter. 
And for uranium, it happens to be closer to a centimeter or a tad over. So we've got a one centimeter, like a, a big raisin or a small marble or something, in the middle of the field on the 50-yard line. The electrons are buzzing around, doing their thing all over the place. And in fact, on that scale, if you look at the electrons, you can't see them at all. They are invisible. In fact, nobody knows how small electrons are. Nobody's ever seen the size of an electron. So they're completely invisible. So all we have after we've done that magnification is that little dot in the middle, which you might not even see if you're on the outside of the thing. Now, in order, if that's a uranium atom, we want it to fission. We're standing outside the atom, and uh, we are a source of neutrons. Now, how big are neutrons? You know, that thing has uranium-235, has 235 protons and neutrons in it. They're all about the same size as each other. One neutron, therefore, is going to be, I don't know, a millimeter or, or less, really tiny. It's like a BB. It's like having a BB gun. So 50 yards away, I've got this thing that's this big that I want to hit. And I've got a BB gun, and this is three-dimensional, not two-dimensional. Uh, my neutron sources, I can't control what direction the neutrons are going to go. So I have a neutron, or let me, let me rephrase it. Suppose I've got another uranium atom over here which did just fission. So it is sending out two or three neutrons, random directions. It's a little bit like taking that BB gun and swinging it around three-dimensionally and firing it randomly three times. Are you going to hit that little thing in the field? No way. I mean, you might, but the probability is microscopic. So if you want to have a chain reaction where one fission will make others occur, the only solution is to have a whole lot of this uranium-235. Now, neutrons travel in straight lines. They're uncharged. If they hit an electron head-on, whatever that might mean, basically nothing happens. It's like a, a bus hitting a butterfly. Or I don't know if you like whatever. <laughs> but the mass, of, the mass of the neutron is so much more than electron, it just goes in a straight line. It's not affected by any charges, and so you just go, 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 and at some point, if you have enough uranium in a pile around this thing, it might happen to hit a nucleus and cause another fission. Now, the distance that a neutron has to travel on average to cause a fission in a ball of pure uranium-235 is about, <clears throat> I think, 12 or 13 centimeters. Uh, it has to travel long ways. It's going to pass through atom after atom after atom, missing the nucleus, and finally, if it hits it, we get another one to go. If we want a chain reaction to, if we want this thing to be a bomb, each time a nucleus fissions and releases a, re releases a whole bunch of energy, the neutrons that come out of that have to cause at least one more fission on average, and the thing can grow and grow and grow. Now, if you want the, now the amount of material that it takes to have a, what's called a critical mass, so that the odds are at least uh, is, is on the order of, of this size. Uh, it's on the order of 10 to 50 kilograms of, of material. Uh, this material, the uranium and plutonium, are extraordinarily... Uh, well, that's too, that's too dramatic. They're dense. <coughs> they have a density of 19 grams per cubic centimeter, which is the same as gold, um, uranium, plutonium, tungsten. There are a whole bunch of things that are around 19 grams per cubic centimeter. We don't often handle large quantities of those things. And I attempted to get for my classroom a, a brick, two by four by eight inches of gold, and decided I couldn't afford it, neither could the school. Uh, so we dropped that idea. I wanted to get a, a brick of plutonium. I thought, oh, that's going to be a critical mass. That's probably not wise. Uranium-235. Actually, I do have um, in fact, whoa, oh, let me show uh, well, all right, I'll show you this in a moment. Uh, th these, are, these are pure uranium metal. Uh, these are pretty rare. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get interested in all this stuff uh, before, way before 9-11 and some other things, and you could go to companies and say, I want to buy a bunch of uranium. Now, this isn't the uranium you can make a bomb out of. Well, although I'm going to pretend it is in a moment. I'm going to do a little fake demonstration if I can. This is what's left over. This is the, the wrong isotope. Uranium-235, uranium-238, so there's lots, there's hundreds of tons of this stuff all over the world for every country that's done uh, uh, isotope uh, separation and stuff. They got lots of that stuff left over. There's, there are thousands of pounds of it in every Boeing 727 for ballast, for the flaps in the wings and the tails, believe it or not. Uh, they use pieces of it in the keels of racing yachts. You want to have something which has a lot of mass for stability, but not a lot of volume for streamness in the water. It has commercial applications.